Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our panel. It is Friday night, which means it's time for knotty, complex, and nerdy improv conversations. It's the only way that I would have it, and I resent the idea that anyone will be doing anything else. You remember pubs? No, I don't. I want my improv conversations nerdy and complex. Um, this is probably going to be my final uh, panel of the year because um, next week we have Chris and then the week after that Heather will be doing uh, her final panel of the year as we wrap up, wrap up towards Christmas. Um, so uh, we, we've, we've got a panel in a couple of weeks time about sort of looking back at 2020 and the weirdness of that. So I wanted to do something which engaged with the question of online improv in a slightly uh, in, a, in a more slightly oblique way, I guess. Um, and as, as I said in the panel last week, we started off choosing the topics of our panels very carefully and thinking very specifically about exactly who would have different alternative views. And we've gradually um, we've gradually transitioned to a place where I'm thinking, uh, who would I quite like to hear talking about improv for a while? And I just invite them. So that's what's happened. We kind of went. Let's get this group of people and what would they be passionate about? So I'm delighted with our um, our guests this evening. They are sort of from here, there and everywhere. And if you'd like to turn on your cameras, uh, we have uh, we have Jewel Huck, we have Irina Wilder and we have Mara Joy Craig. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. How are you all cold? Are you all as cold as me? Because it's freezing, right? <laughs> yeah, cool. I've, got, I've, got the, I've got the thing where uh, you know when you're cold and warm at the same time and to me that provides a lulling effect so I'm sort of getting a little sleepy I don't know if that happens to anyone else <laughs> yeah. so if Joel falls asleep by the end of this panel then we know what happened there um, Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the irony of a, of a British person kind of starting off by talking about the um, starting off by talking about the weather although it's it's core to our cultural values isn't it um I'd like to start by just kind of going around the room. Uh, you all are folks who have done a decent chunk of online improv and no expectation or resentment to those people who um, have done uh, done less or don't find it's for them. I wondered, I'd, just, I'd be intrigued to hear how, how doing improv in an online space and therefore a space which is not really anywhere you know, this, this this panel is not happening in my house and Joel's house or in his house, Mara's house. I, I'd be intrigued to how to hear how you think that has affected the way you improvise. The fact that we're sort of in in the internet when we improvise. Um, Irina, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. mm, first of all, time zones just screwed up my schedule, <laughs> just like I guess for everybody. Um, that was the first and most uh, visible effect. Um, being connected to people from all over the world and just learning things from people whom I would have never met if online improv did not happen. That was amazing. And it's still happening. And I'm like, if we ever go back to our theaters, let's just keep this. This is mm. awesome. And yeah, and I love a lot of discussions that are happening on a much broader level and bringing in people who otherwise would have no voice in those discussions and just um, having that time for reflection. That's, that's also awesome. I, I've heard a lot of people describing this year as a period of continuous personal development. That's what it is. Okay. As an improviser, as a teacher, yeah, as a human, let's learn something. Yes, I've 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 heard it described as that, but with the word enforced going on the front. <laughs> like none of us. Um, there's a lovely thing. I've forgotten her name. There's a is it Esther Perel, the French lady who who wrote a couple of books about relationships. Um, yeah, that's her. Yeah, that's that's her name, isn't it? And she has this wonderful thing of I wouldn't. I wouldn't wish an affair on any relationship, but if one has happened, let us learn and gain from it, which I think is really lovely. Um, <laughs> it was kind of what you're saying here. It's like enforced, but fresh and um, Joel, what about yourself? What 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 is this done? Apart from the fact that we're all in boxes and we're all learning about eye lines and cameras and eye lines, what's it, what's it done for you? Uh, oh boy. Um, <laughs> it's uh, given me a lot more opportunities to teach. So that's been nice uh, and really fun. And, uh, like Irina said, uh, uh, getting to meet uh, really 
enthusiastic people from all over the world in improv and you know i've sort of, sort of got bored with the uk's offering of those people so <laughs> i'm kidding of course i love you all uh uh yeah uh but yeah it's been really cool to uh meet people from all over the world of uh different levels of enthusiasm and uh and uh, uh sort of uh, ability and things but um uh i would also um i think sort of go slightly against the premise of the question i think that this meeting and any class does happen in your room and my room and uh, irina's room and mara's room as well as the internet i think it does happen in, in our rooms and like one hypothesis I have, and I'd be interested in anyone's opinion on this is that uh, I think that adds a sort of uh, a, a, a layer of collective vulnerability and therefore a collective uh, trust and acceptance. Uh, yeah, I think we are more likely to accept one another, less likely to judge one another because we're all in that same vulnerable position of opening up our homes to everyone else's scrutiny and opening up our, you know, uh, lockdown wardrobes and things. You know, we're not we're not wearing outdoor clothing all the time, right? So, um, so I think there's I think there's something there in the fact that we every time we go into a class or a show, we're sort of inviting people into our homes, and uh, which is uh not a thing that happens in the meat space where we're going to a a place that is neutral to most people so there's that to it i think people have been particularly uh welcoming and kind and the feedback you get at the end of every class is oh, so great to meet so and so from here and there and uh yeah it's that i just noticed that more than in uh in sort of uh face-to-face -face improv so that's the thing i'd mention uh, yeah there's something so exciting about seeing people who've never met physically who are sometimes up to like ten thousand miles apart from each other and, and just like, oh my god so and so's here and it's like that's so like, that, that that kind of little burst of um uh, enthusiasm is really delightful uh, mara what about you uh, yeah um i mean i want to echo what uh, joelle said but also um I didn't uh, do uh, online improv for like the first couple of months because I was like, I'm not going to. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a complete break from it all. I'm just going to get on doing other stuff. Um, and then didn't because that doesn't work. Cause I, I, I couldn't not. Um, <laughs> so I started doing more classes. I've, I've, I've only performed like one show, but I've done a lot of classes now. And I've taught a couple. And uh, it's... It was weird coming in when everything that people were talking about about this uh, connectivity was already start was already established. Mm -hmm. So I came in and like and people were like, oh, I know this guy. So I'm like, oh, when did you meet them? And you're like, a month ago, and and another Zoom call. I was like, all oh, right, okay, sorry, I thought you meant you knew them. I was like, no, I do know them, uh, and that's been really interesting. Uh, one thing that's really I because uh, I'm based in Edinburgh and we have a very small scene. Uh, for 11 months of the year and then we have the fringe for one month of the year so I meet a lot of people in that one month and then then improvise with the same like 20 people for the rest of the year um so it's been really great like every week being able to sort of go into a class and it not being the same 20 people that I've been performing with I've been like doing classes with for years like so we, we'll get teachers up to, to teach or, or teachers across or from wherever to teach us uh, but it's always the same people that you're learning with and that's great to like to, for that thing of like building up that sort of trust and camaraderie but also I'm someone who really, really learns and evolves from playing with as many different people as possible like I I set up a, a show that I do at the Edinburgh Fringe specifically for the purpose of playing with as many different people as possible. Um, so and I that... still remember the last time we played that show together, one of us ended up milking the other. Uh, yes, uh, you, you ended up milking me and then, right. then handing those glasses to everyone in the audience. <laughs> uh, it was a very weird show. Uh, very weird show. Um, but... Yeah, and I would never have done that if I'd been doing that with uh, someone from nearby. Uh, and also one thing related to that is 
a lot of the people who I usually take classes with are people who I have taught. Mm. So, and it's, I don't mean, I'm not being big headed to, to say this. It's just a fact that I'm one of the more experienced people in Ed, as an improviser at Edinburgh. Whereas if I go on uh, a Zoom call with people like, I'm, 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 it's people who have been doing it longer than me or as long as me or, I just it's just a much bigger variety, whereas it's always people who whose improv was inf- influenced by me. You know, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So it's just been I don't know. It's just been good to get out of that bubble. Yeah, yeah. I think um, which kind of leads um, leads us to talk about uh, arenas. Uh, you've started running a couple of classes and giving some giving some thought to particularly the idea of culture, which is like, it's a really naughty word because culture can kind of be anything, right? I, I keep finding myself doing this in Zoom calls. I think uh, this is more in baby sign language. You can teach baby sign language and this is more. Um, so yeah, there you are, teach that to a baby. Um, you've been uh, you've been giving some thought on that. In fact, run a class last night, which I wasn't able to make it to for heavily pregnant partner reasons. I wondered like, what led you to what led you to be doing specifically that class and how do you approach the idea of culture? Because when, when someone says culture, it, make, it makes me scared because it seems like such a huge thing to deal with. It seems like it's a whole section of a library. You know what I mean? It's, um, <laughs> so yeah, how, how, how do you approach it in a way which is manageable for improvisers? I guess that's the, the, the question I'm asking. It's not manageable, so. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Well, <laughs> <laughs> for one workshop, <laughs> Just what what we've done yesterday it was like um, wetting our toes essentially, getting a little bit aware of what culture is and and why different cultures exist and how they manifest essentially. So there is visible culture, there is language, there are names, there is food, art, music, anything, literature, and then there are. Um, all sorts of beliefs and attitudes and notions that are invisible. They live in our subconscious and they usually manifest through the visible culture, but we don't consciously think about them um, because, yeah, why would we if we grew up with, with those notions of what is a long or short time or what is um, my favorite food, a usual street food, or what is a very beautiful name. Uh, But all those notions of modesty or honor, of family relationships, of status, of when it is an appropriate time to get married or whether marriage is even a thing in your culture, all of those things should ideally come up in our scenes, except they don't. Mm. And I got really interested in the question why. And I started talking to other people. I started talking to other improvisers, mostly international improvisers, those for whom English is not their first language. And for some of them, not even their second language. And it turned out that we all kind of tried to fit in within the dominant culture of predominantly white, Western or more specifically white American proto-culture. We don't have any lived experience of that culture. I've never been to an American college, but we have a better notion of that culture from the Hollywood movies or from, from the specific details that American improvisers bring in the scenes like that. Uh, so it's much easier for everybody just to try and fit in in that culture than try and bring our own cultures on stage because that could get weird, that could get uncomfortable, that could lead to people playing stereotypes. I'm Russian. Um, do you want me to name all the stereotypes of Russians that could be played? I don't think so, but there could be villains. I don't want to play with those. So, although I have I have seen you play a villain, and it was terrifying. 
Um, so it's not that it's not. I love all... playing villains, but that's not because I'm. A... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's totally true. That's just because you're you have a very dark sense of humor. That's irre like independent of the Russian thing. Oh God! <laughs> uh, now I have to do a whole section a session on self reflection and why <laughs> do I love to play villains. Um, <laughs> so the idea that we came up with, um, and when I say we, that's Tanya Donay is a wonderful Iranian improviser from Amsterdam, and and I and what we taught yesterday is let's just open this Pandora box and see what's inside. What happens when I bring in uh, an unusual name. So instead of uh, Trevor, Colin, Jack, Barbara, and Karen, what happens if I call you Giovanni, Lars, um, and uh, Nadia? Mm. What happens then? And everybody goes, uh, um, uh, then this name should mm. have significance, right? No, it shouldn't. It should be, it should have the same right to appear in an improv scene as as Jack and Jane, except it doesn't. Why not? So from, from those small details like names and then discovering everything about beliefs and stereotypes, we can have one workshop that is kind of manageable, although yeah, we had a, a longer discussion after the workshop, but then it could be a series or should be a series of continuous um, sessions that is on discovering what what it is and why is it important and why one thing that I, I've noticed and I, I realized that I keep keep talking but this is <laughs> something that I would love to hear your opinion on so um, international improvisers or those who were born um, in, in Western countries, but have mixed background, have maybe parents who are first or second generation uh, immigrants. They're very aware that different cultures exist and sometimes they mix them flawlessly and it's beautiful. But American improvisers, particularly white American improvisers, and they're wonderful. They're amazing people and they're beautiful improvisers, but they go, Oh, I feel connected to the whole world. I can improvise, I can reflect anything. So they see their own culture as universal and bring that attitude of, yeah, my culture is here, but they don't see that as their culture. They see their own experiences as perfectly universal for everybody. Um, I wonder if, if, if you had the same experience because a lot of international improvisers do, but... I want to throw this to Joelle because everything you're saying, I've, I've sort of had parallel conversations with both of you. Um, and obviously, Joelle, I think you your parents were second gen themselves. Is that correct? Uh, they were uh, they were born in Bangladesh and uh, immigrated here in the seventies. So, uh, okay, so your your yeah. your second gen apologies. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, basically, I was going to ask a question, but now I just think I'll just go. Hey, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I, yeah. I I grew up between two cultures. The the attempt by my parents to uh, raise me as a, a a Bengali with Beng the Bengali value system and everything, but very much uh, growing up in London with uh, in English schools and English TV and media and everything. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, aware that uh, um, uh, Western culture isn't the only thing going around um and yeah the the point you uh, bring bringing up names Irina reminded me of just just the fact that um being from despite being from uh, uh Bangladesh ethnically I there's only been once ever in an improv scene where my a character of mine was uh endowed with an Asian name <laughs> only once in like the six or seven years I've been doing improv uh, is or yeah in general Western names and uh, English derived names. So that's a thing that uh, that happens and we can be better at. Um, I, I perform in comedians, which is a 
a UK-based improv group that brings together as many Asian improv, Asian sort of uh, descended improvisers as we can. And uh, I think that's the thing we're sort of actively working on, like, um, yeah, in giving more East Asian, South Asian, etc., names to our characters. So that's a way we're trying to break that uh, barrier down. Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it's like to be someone who uh, thinks that the culture they grew up in is is is, is universal because I grew up in between two uh, or through into. So yeah, that's it. And so aware of the fact that other cultures exist, but they're not being portrayed on our improv stages. Yeah, uh, I mean. Obviously, everyone wants a white guy's um, angle on this. Obviously, that's what's necessary right now. But I have, um, whenever, I feel like names are symbolic of something deeper, which is pretty much what you were saying, Irina. Like, it's a, it's a symbol of a larger set of beliefs, if I hang on outside it. But um, I, I play safe with names because I'm worried about stumbling into an area I don't know. But that's a, that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? Um, or I, where, you know, I, I, I use a name... And then I worry, like, I'm going to use a name. And then, Joel, you're going to say, that's an Indian name, not, not a Bangladeshi name. And I'm going to go, oh, fuck, I had no intention. But obviously, <laughs> you know, but also, that's not an excuse. That's just, you know, thing. Um, Mara, I, I feel like, um, I guess one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that made me think about this in the context of um, uh, you in the context of this conversation is that I feel like um, Edinburgh is maybe a less diverse city than London, but I also realize I have no fucking idea if that's true. That might just be my prejudices about Edinburgh. So I, I'm wondering if this is, op if this is opening up, um, if this, if part of the opening up for you is that there's just more improvisers from more different backgrounds available, but I honestly generally and I have no idea. Uh Edinburgh is one of the whitest cities in the UK. It's 92% white. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's crazy. Uh, uh, I looked this up uh, today because I was like, I'm pretty sure that's correct. And then I double checked and went, yeah, it's 92% white. Uh, wow. And that's a little whiter than the UK average, I think. So. Yeah. What yeah. is the UK average out of curiosity? About say? nine in 10. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, and that's heavily skewed by some very very white rural areas. Uh, I'm from uh, there. I'm, I'm I'm from the very white rural areas. I know what they look like. But, <laughs> so uh, uh, and also just in terms of population, Edinburgh has a population of like seven hundred thousand. Uh, mm. Like because uh, Joe and uh, Joe, you're both based in London, which has twice the population of Scotland. Mm -hmm. which is the entire country I live in. Um, uh, so demographics get really complicated, like, in terms of... Yeah, so, like, demographics don't tell the whole story. So, like, I can say that, yeah, I can say that Edinburgh's 92% white, but Edinburgh feels even whiter than 92% white, like, just uh, as, a, as a, a place to live. Uh, like, it's... Edinburgh also is incredibly middle to upper middle class, which is a huge, a huge thing. Uh, or the, that's uh, it's, it's so difficult to like to make these big sweeping generalizations, right? Because I just I, I just made two massive sweeping generalizations, uh, but there are also things that I intrinsically believe to be true about this about this uh, city, and uh, and that is. Unfortunately, been reflected for uh, our improv scenes for uh, our way of working, and it's something that I've I've been thinking about a lot <laughs> uh, since I've been since this has opened up. Because, like you say, like when I say I'm performing with people I've never performed with before, I'm performing with people uh, like whose perspectives I have never heard before. Which is great. Like I love that. Like, but it's, it's that thing where it's like, it's like rewiring your brain in a good way. When somebody makes a reference, I'm like, I have no idea what that is. That's amazing. I I want to know more about what this is. Uh, or somebody, um, like, uh, just the whole thing about giving names. I think like that's such a beautiful encapsulation of the whole thing, right? I don't names are. I, 
got a huge thing about names. Uh, like I, obsessed with names. I mean, I chose my own. Uh, like it's a whole thing. Um, but this whole idea that, um, yeah, that you've never like the Joe saying you've never been given a Bengali name in your entire thing. It's that's like ridiculous <laughs> but like it's it's honestly like I can't I, I think that needs to be like read even more clear like it's the default is so ingrained into uh entertainment as a whole right uh, which we then filter down into oh so we're performing entertainment so we should perform to that default is just so deeply held that uh any conversation about it and any action about it especially is just great like i let's keep let, let yes <laughs> that's mm-hmm. what i'm saying i'm just oh, i'm getting excited but yes i'm not very um speaky i, I think we're all doing great i think i think none of us need to apologize i think we're all doing great <laughs> um i want to um i'm just going to read out a uh just with reference to what Joe was saying a second ago, a comment um, from Sai. Uh, uh, it's funny when um, uh, this is funny when I get given a character that has to do an accent. My natural Indian accent comes out, even though the scene takes place in the Wild West, which I just thought was like that's a lovely, uh, like the idea of mashing together these great big. You, you and I, Irina, have emailed about this kind of big american cultural monoliths like the wild west and just mashing it together and going yeah we can do that with an indian accent that's just fun um so i think let's let's pull this back to the idea of culture like like the separation of international cultures or possibly different bits of international cultures um and i ask this question how do we create uh in the online space how do we create classes which are either neutral if that's possible I suspect it's not or if not um, as welcoming to as many cultures as possible and I ask with genuine question of like because I'm I have such um, like simplicity of identity my family has moved about 50 miles in about 200 years because my dad's done that thing that retired people do of tracing back your family so I'm like I, I, the stuff which you're describing here, even um, Irina, you're in Sweden, right? Irina, is that right? Yeah. Like even moving from Russia to Sweden, which is not that far compared to like Bangladesh to London. Um, even even that I can't understand in the start. I'm like, I don't even know what that experience looks like. So so how do we how do we create situations which are as welcoming to as many different cultures as possible, both grand sweeping statements and small practical actionable things? I'm going to throw that open to the space of like, oh, who's going to go first? And we're all being polite. <laughs> uh, I'll just, op- I guess I'll open with one small thought, uh, which, uh, I mean, I'm trying to uh, work on that problem through a, a course that I'll be offering uh, through the nursery in the new year. Um, Good luck. Sort of plugged you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one part, one part of that course and one part of the solution, I think, is to uh, teach and empower people uh, in the cultural majority to be able to play with offers they don't fully know and understand. Uh, um, sometimes as if they know it, but at the very least with a sense of curiosity and investigation and a willingness to play. And I think what happens too often is a is a reaction of, I don't know that. Let's make the scene about something else. Mm. Uh, whereas what I would love to see is uh, in scene and uh, just an exploration. And so that way the uh, a minority culture can get portrayed on stage while, while involving a person of the cultural majority. So that's one. Uh, uh, is that the biggest piece of the puzzle? I think it's one thing anyway. So that's, a, that's my opening gambit to that. Uh, question uh, it, it's that feeling of like um trying to put like putting a specific and an unimportant specific on it it's like someone starting to mime a card game which you don't play you just like you just treat it like you do mm. yeah um, yeah exactly uh, kind of yes without ending yeah yeah 
uh, or an exercise that um, uh, uh, you, you, you've ran on me in rehearsals where you've been my director and stuff, where um, you have a, one person open a scene with their own personal area of expertise, mm. uh, niche area of expertise, and the other person uh, interact with that as if they also know things about it and make blind offers to it and things. So uh, I, I see nods around there. I think people recognize that exercise. So yeah, I think it doesn't have to be just knowledge, right? It can be about uh, lived experience too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Irina Romara, how to, how to make it open and friendly to people from all kinds of contexts. We've got some good comments, which I'm going to come to in a second, but. Just taking what Joe said and just like that, that, um, that you say that's a small thing, but that's a huge thing, right? Uh, so often I hear from people who, um, like didn't grow up watching the same TV as our mm. people and they're like going, oh, but when people make a reference to Star Wars, I feel really ashamed. And I'm like, that, like, no, like, <laughs> so I can't exactly tell someone to, no, don't feel ashamed. Uh, and that doesn't help. But it's that thing of, it's, it's so interesting to me that, that I say interesting with inverted commas, that people are ashamed about that, but aren't ashamed at not knowing something that's not from the dominant like monoculture, right? It should be the other way round, or not even ashamed. It should be, you should, everyone should be empowered to be like, hey, this is a thing I know about, so I'm going to talk about it. And everyone else should be, if we're being curious, uh, playful, uh, supportive improvisers, then it's our job to be like, oh, awesome. Let's do this scene that you've just put forward rather than going, I don't I don't know anything about this. And we, we're so quick to say that about like pop culture stuff, but about actual lived culture, it's, everyone sort of gets very scared of it. Mm. Uh, and it's just, I, I think it's a, just a shift in how we view what is the default, like what assumptions people make. Uh, I've been really, I've been really bad in the past to go for saying uh, as a shortcut for a scene uh, when I say you should know each other or at least make assumptions about each other. And I've been rethinking how I phrase that because I don't know if I want to be promoting people making assumptions about themselves because they'll make assumptions that fit with their own personal. You know, like, mm -hmm. and then therefore they'll endow people with things that they already expect, and then we le that leads to seeing the same scenes over and over. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? It totally does, and it makes me want to read out one of these comments, if I may. We'll come to you in a second, yeah. but just as a comment from um, from Jeanne. Hi, Jeanne. Um, uh, Jeanne is apparently a top fan. I don't know what that means, but Facebook has top fans. Jeanne's a top fan. Um, top fan. And she's disappeared because someone else commented. Um, the, this is not the question that I was asking. Um, beyond names, cultural differences also weigh on everyone's expectation of what the next obvious thing to do in a scene yeah. is, or what funny means, or what or what kind of funny feels confident. And I think that's a really, um, I hundred percent agree with that. I, I I use the word obvious a lot in classes, and I also spend a lot of time saying I don't mean correct. I just mean don't do any cognitive labor around it just say the thing that falls out of your brain but i'm fully aware that that's a very what's the that's word a clumsy it's a clumsy way of phrasing it i think that's a much better way of saying what i was trying to say that jan has given uh because yeah the, the, when you say the obvious thing what we mean is the obvious thing to you yeah but that's not what is expressed and it's not what is acted on you're right. Uh, like what, what Irina was saying before, people assimilate to the dominant culture and go, oh, I'll say what I expect I am meant to say, yeah, rather I than I will say what I would immediately say. One of, one of the big things that I, uh, like this is such a small thing, uh, I will just, if something pops out of my head, I'm like, nobody will get this reference, nobody will know this, it's a really obscure thing that only I care about, and I'll go, fine, I'm going to say it. <laughs> um, because, uh, like, nothing, you know, uh, it's what came into my head. And to do otherwise is to do that cognitive labor, is to go, wait, no, censor that, change this, fix mm. this. And mm. it might be like uh, something obscure and something that only 2% of the audience will get. But those 2% of the audience are people who are 
invested in the same things that I'm invested in and will be excited to see the thing that they're invested in talked about on stage, you know? But it's also the fact that um, we're not, people don't come to improv to watch what, like if you go to an improv show and you enjoy it and you come back, it's not because of what those players should have said. It's because you go, hey, Jewel, Arena, and Mara, I like them. I like how their brain, I want to see the stuff that their brain does. I want to see them processing information. So like when you, um, when you deny that immediately, it's not just about the kind of cultural references. It's also about the kind of shape of idea oh, yeah. that's possible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Arena, we've we've ducked away from you answering the question. Um, uh, but, but long enough. You've been avoiding the question long enough. Oh, uh, we, we demand that. I'm going to to expand on on the thing that uh, Joel and and Mara have said. So the idea is, um, people who international improvisers are already doing this. If somebody brings in um, a cultural reference or an object or whatever that um, somebody from India, from Russia, from wherever, just doesn't know, they have to feign it because they want to fit in. They want to play. They like, if we say that communication is a two way street, uh, people from the minority, people from less dominant culture usually go all the way. They come to you here mm -hmm. so yeah. that people with more power, people from the dominant culture actually have to do less less work. They already have more power and they have to work less because everybody comes to that. Right? So what Joel is saying, uh, how do we open this idea to everybody? So if there is something that you don't know, it's not from your culture, you don't project it as something weird, you don't project it as something that shouldn't be there because I wasn't expecting it. You just come and play with it, even if it's not from your culture. You you don't know it. I love uh, like the first workshop I I've had with Patty Styles, and that was the exact question somebody asked. Like there was a cultural reference. I don't know what that cultural reference was, and she was like, "So what?" Now you've invented a whole new reality. Somebody mentioned orange is the new black. You don't know what it is. Great. Say, I love culinary shows. Great. <laughs> now you have orange is the new black, which is a, a perfect culinary show. Great. You, you've created this new reality where everybody is actually welcomed. And that is probably a lot more interesting than, than your average improv scene that is very rooted in the, yeah, let's just improvise a, a plot from one of the movies that both of us have seen or something. Um, a big part of them, my mum started improvising and she, <laughs> uh, and I think Mari improvised yeah, yeah. with her, right? I, think. I have. Um, I, I did oh, a, maybe Duel has as well. Um, uh, I did a fantastic scene for a midday's retreat, which I uh, adored. <laughs> she's a good improviser she's a really good improviser um uh and she she had exactly this thing of like well what happens if and it was it was it, this was like the the what's the word what's the name of that thing that sort of um you use to open a window if a window's jammed like a, a robber would use to open a window like a piece a of crowbar a crowbar that's the thing and uh, this was like the the crowbar to open the window of her improv confidence was around things like TV and film because she doesn't really watch TV or films very much. And um, and she's a, a, a little older. So a lot of the things which were the obvious references to people of my age and I'm, I am the kind of the dominant average age of improvisers, I guess, probably maybe a little older than it now. Um, and initially, as soon as anyone mentioned anything, she would feel terrified. And it was the sort of, it was the crowbar of her feeling really confident and like, yes, people are here to watch me. Yes, people do enjoy me being good at impro improv was to deliberately get things wrong. Like this was one of the conversations we had several times in her garden of like, what if someone mentioned Star Wars? Like, just get it wrong. Just say, you know, Princess Leia is a bad guy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Star Wars person, but I, I love watching it being horrifically butchered because, and, and, I, and I think it's not just about, like there's an acceptance part of it, but there's also a delight for the audience. It's really fun to watch people play with what's wrong and what's right and have those kind of laughter responses. And we have to be you know, careful about exactly what we're doing there, but yeah. Um, I have, there's a comment that I wanted to read out, which I thought was quite um, 
interesting, uh, which is about people who, um, there's actually two comments, but there's been a couple of others, so I'll find them in a second and, and try to summarize, about people who learn improv not in their native language and then go back and start improvising in the native language. I don't know which language you started improvising in, um, Irina. Um, but there's, I, 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 there's sometimes this feeling of there being a kind of a universal culture of improv, which is harder to take back into French or into Russian or into whatever language is, is, is it your kind of mother tongue. Um, and some people, and I've had this conversation with, um, uh, with Marie, um, uh, Marie Duval, who you all know, I'm sure. And she says she just doesn't want to improvise in German. She just doesn't want to do that. It doesn't feel like it's a natural thing to her. And I wonder what your thoughts on that were in terms of like identity and expression, like how difficult it is to convert that stuff back into your native language. And I guess I'm going to throw it to Arena because you're the only person here who was, I believe, fully bilingual. Um, right. or just, like, um, if I'm insulting you, um, Joanna Mara. Uh, so I've learned improvising in, or improv, I've discovered improv as an art form in English. And I started performing in English and all of my performances, um, are mostly in, in English, but I've tried improvising in Russian, Swedish, and Italian. So those are, um, all the languages that, that I can usually normally have fluent conversations without any problem um, at any point but um, I've discovered that in any in every language even in my mother tongue it's like a different person who doesn't quite know the improviser and like has to has to meet that improviser and kind of discover that yeah I know how yes and works and it's partially about terminology. Like I, I still have to translate what, I would have no idea what long form or um, yes and in Russian would just sound weird. And even if I don't try to translate all those terms, it's just, mm. so even though I might be more fluent in another language than English, it doesn't mean that I would be a better improviser. Mm if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, I, I just, I stick with English. I have a horrible accent or not, but it's, uh, yeah, my party trick is to start speaking with a really hard Russian accent. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I guess it, it comes with, with practice. I've met improvisers who, like I, I know a, a bunch of improvisers from Israel, for instance, and they have a great school in Tel Aviv or, or Jerusalem. So they've learned improvising there and then they come to international festivals and they improvise in English. No problem at all. And for me, this sounds like amazing being not just truly bilingual, but bilingual improviser or multilingual improviser. That's, that's awesome. I sort of wish, I feel like improv festivals would benefit as much as any other bit of the world from um, a sort of universal translator. I'm now aware that I'm thinking in terms of Star Trek references or whatever, um, but like a universal translator that would enable everyone to improvise in their native language because I've seen so many shows with people who don't spend their whole time speaking English. So their English is perfectly good, better than my whatever the language is in, in, in most cases, in every case. Um, but I still feel like oh, I just wish I could see your show in your language because I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I've, I've found I found the question, which was much better phrasing than my cobbling it together, which was this. How many of us feel we don't quite, we don't, how many of us feel we don't sound quite as genuine when we improvise back in our native language after spending too much time with our North American or British or third culture characters slash personas, which was just a better way of saying the thing I was trying to say. And it was Jeanne again. <laughs> Basically, we should have had Jan on this panel and we should have all just like not bothered turning up. That's what should have happened today. Um, so we'll know. Um, I've got a comment here um, from Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, Mead, who many of you all know. This is, this is with reference to the, the card game thing, which I, the analogy, which I clumsy analogy which I used earlier. And he says, it's so hard though, because I'll happily get the rules of a card game wrong, 
but I'd be horrified to get someone's cultural specifics wrong. And I got quite a few of the, your, your Facebook thumbs. And I wondered your thoughts about that because what, one can blunder and one can look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. I'm marvelous. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have uh, a weird experience with this. Uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, for anyone who's watching this who isn't aware, I'm trans, hello. Uh, and I had a conversation with someone who I regularly improvise with. Uh, like, like basically we improvise with together all the time. I, I improvise with him all the time. And he was talking about, he was at a show in the US where he was watching a team who have a, uh, a player who uh, is in a wheelchair and they were doing a show where everyone was in wheelchairs for the show, like as a sort of thing. And then he had a QA and a afterwards. Uh, and he asked her, have you ever been endowed as a character who is in a wheelchair? And she was like, no, literally never. Even though I am visibly in a wheelchair the hmm. entire time I'm on stage, it has never been mentioned ever in any of the shows. And he was telling me that story going, isn't that weird? And I was like, um, you know, you've never known me as a character who's trans, right? Like, ever. Like, it's never come up. It's never been a thing that's ever happened. And, and he was like, oh, yeah, I guess I haven't. And then we talked about it. And he was like, well, I'm just, uh, you know, it is that thing of, I was worried that if I did that, I would be putting you in a position where you'd have to explain yourself, or I would be putting you in a position where you'd have to be a spokesperson for, or I would be putting you in this position. And I'm like, I'm fine with you putting me in a position of being me. That's a that's a position that I'm in all the time. You know, like every time I leave the house, I'm in that position. Uh, I'm, I'm used to it. I know what that is. I'm aware of myself enough that if you endow me as a character who is also the thing that I am, or also shares an identity with me, I'm going to know what to say. So you don't have to worry about you saying the right thing because I will, if that makes sense. And I, I, so I think about this a lot when people bring up the idea of, I don't, and I, I've, I've had that same thought where I'm like, I don't want to bring this up in case I say the wrong thing. And it's like, the worst thing that will happen is you'll be corrected. That's it, like, that's it. <laughs> that's the worst thing that will happen. And I think we just all need to be, we're so, we're so used to improv to be like, you can get things wrong. You, can, you can't get things wrong. Whatever you say will be correct. And then we tell ourselves that I can't say this thing because I'll say the incorrect thing. And it's, it's a false barrier. It's not real. Huh. Uh, yeah, and uh, I would say that uh, if an improviser in that position is sort of uncomfortable with uh making assumptions in the uh in the yes syndrome about uh, a person whose experience they don't share uh perhaps the alternative is uh investigate curiously uh you know ask questions uh you can if you feel that way chances are most of the audience do too so you get to be the voice of the audience curiously investigating the uh experience of uh someone who uh is is uh different in some significant way and we get we all get to learn about that person and people like them and uh you know that isn't that a good thing to have in the middle of a show you know maybe improv isn't just a fun way of making up jokes maybe we can learn about each other Ooh. oh I, I so much quite it. a book no no it's really um arena you were going to say something go ahead yeah, um, this is one of the ideas we, we worked yesterday in, in the workshop. Um, so there is this notion in, uh, in the um, theory of literature, which is called the unmarked state. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the idea of it is very simple and very powerful. Um, if I'm writing a novel or a story, I own, I have to specify physical characteristics or social characteristics of characters um, uh, such as women, um, 
non-heterosexual characters, non-cisgendered characters. I have to specify that my character is a pregnant teenager. I have to specify that my character is not able-bodied. It's a blind um, ninja or blind uh, priest. I never have to specify that my character is a white, young, able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual male. I, I can mention the color of his eyes or his clothes or whatever, but I never have to say it in, in the same way as I have to say that my character is a pregnant woman. And this is what happens in, in improv, right? We, we don't give names, we don't specify characteristics, we don't mention any, any of the stuff that is not important because we are afraid of making a mistake, because we are afraid of being misunderstood, because we want to take care of, of the audience. But what happens is if we don't bring in those details and those characters, they don't exist. If we don't have female characters on stage, women in this universe don't exist. If we don't bring trans characters on stage, they don't exist. And if we don't play other cultures on stage, however, badly, however carefully or hesitantly, if we don't have them on stage, they don't exist. And that is, for me personally, is a way sadder, a, a way more tragic thing than somebody attempting to be Russian or Swedish or Italian, as honestly as, as they can, bringing in their own take on, on being human with those specific details. Just, I don't want to, to give, like, indulge yourself in playing whatever culture because then it's like um, an absolution, a, a permission to play whatever stereotype you can come up with. And stereotypes are usually like, it, it could get really bad real fast let's not it depends not every situation would be but like Joel said if we just cope and all come to it with with an open mind with the curiosity and with the idea of oh i don't know how to play this culture but i realize that it's a different culture and i want to learn about it i want to know more about it then maybe, just maybe, next time you will be more open to play that culture and you will actually know more if you read between, the, between your shows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great thing. We do things badly on the way to doing things well, right? So the, first, the first time you play another culture, we're, you're going to do it badly. It's, just, it's going to be horrible. And then you go, maybe I'll juggle that next time. We are on a clock because uh, Mara has a class in about like like six minutes time so we're going to finish there there's so much there. there's some great comments so have a read of that i don't have the time to read it out because we have to um uh finish this on time there's some really cool stuff there about in, uh, uh, improvising in the second language and also just good stuff um thank you so much for being with us chris will be here next week um looking back over 2020 as uh, a year of weirdness for improv but thank you so much to Joel, to arena and to mara it's been a delightful conversation which i wish were three hours long take care of yourself good night everyone Bye. Bye. thanks <laughs>